So welcome, you guys, to another edition of Passion for Success, where it's all about inspiration. And today, we are with the GOAT, one of the greatest female soccer players of all time, World Cup champion in 91 and 99, plus a bronze Olympic gold medalist. And oh, by the way, she had 105 goals during her playing career. She's also an animal lover with a huge heart and a mom the one and only Michelle Akers. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us here today. So excited to be with you. Thanks. Thanks, Mitt. Anytime. Um, <laughs> so now that we've had some time to kind of digest, you know, what are you most proud of from your national team playing career? Oh my gosh. Um, geez. I think just making it that long, you know, with 15 years, it was a long time to be on that team and to play at that level and then to have like so many injuries over, you know, God, over 20 ish knee surgeries during that career, shoulder surgery. So to have, to be able to play at that level um, for that long and contribute to my team. And um, that, that to me was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's um, a every- huge accomplishment. Um, you know, I like to always kind of start all these interviews by asking, asking national teamers what role did your parents play um in your love for the game of soccer from a young age it's such a good question um yeah i think you know because when i was growing up there wasn't tons of there there wasn't tons of soccer for girls so and i was kind of a rebel uh rebellious kid um or and didn't fit into the typical you know girl zone of girl scouts or ballerina things and you know i got in fight in a fight in bluebirds and was kicked out of ballet so thank god but um so they kind of let me uh, pursue my thing so i played you know football in the street with the boys and uh played baseball and they put me into soccer let's try this and they I, i think that was their you know, the, the greatest thing they could have done for me is just kind of open the doors for me and let me try uh, what I was most passionate about and then support me um, along that way to keep exploring, but also continue doing the things I, I loved, even though, you know, it wasn't um, a, an incredibly popular activity for, for girls at the time. Yeah, I mean, to say that you played for the first ever is, is pretty cool, Michelle. Yeah, um, yeah, and it makes me feel old, <laughs> uh, too, which isn't bad, but it, it's so weird. Not, and it's like, right? Because, yeah, I mean, you guys. But it's um, just so cool to see. You've been, been there, you've done that. You're yeah. one of the only ones. I mean, how, yeah. how neat is that? Yeah, it is, it is. It's so cool. It's so cool. And I think it's an important story to tell, too. You know, because those those people that were there were really incredible, and um, they're just going and doing their life, and they were part of something that was is is um, amazing and continues because of you know people like you and it, so many others have continued on, um, tr- you know, helping keep this foundation, but also create um, and and break new ground, right, for this U.S. team. And so it's so, it's so exciting to look back, but then it's also uh, really exciting to, to see um, what everyone's doing now and how well this team is doing. It's fun. Yeah. And to see how far we've come. Um, I mean, you're three time uh, gold medal Olympian. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Over a hundred caps. I mean, that is that is super cool. So I, you know, I am um, probably more excited to be able to talk to you and be here than you would be to me. So that, I think well, it's you're like an incredible legend. legacy yes. for you. Uh, you're, you're the goat. Um, I mean, I, I only had an opportunity to play with you once. And funny story is it was like a inner squad game. Um, I was throwing it in and uh, the player that I was throwing it to was about five, five foot. And she did a check over her shoulder and she looked back and you're right on her back. And she's like, don't throw it to me. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it. I don't oh, want it. That's know. funny. Yeah. But I just remember just being in awe of you. And obviously, you know, I played with Christine Lilly for a long time and she had nothing yeah. but the, the most amazing things to say about you and just um, over your career, you know, it's just so cool to get you on here and get your perspective. So you are, you grew up in California. Yeah. 
in the world did you end up at UCF? I know. So I grew up in California in Santa Clara area, Santa Cruz. Um, and then we moved to Seattle when I was in like fourth grade or so. And um, so then, let me see, I was in high school and playing for an under 19 team, like at age 14 or something. And the, so Anson Dorrance was, was at a practice with my team recruiting some of those players. And I met him and he was like, oh, you know, wow, what schools are you looking at? And I was like, Shorecrest High School. You know, I didn't even know really college things at that time. And so he's like, what? How old are you? And I, I said, like, 14. And he was like, oh, my God, don't even talk to me. And so he, like, ran away from me. And I didn't even, you know, I'm like, what? What the hell, guy? Um, and so then um, after that, I realized, oh, my gosh, he's – there, there's D1 soccer uh, for women and with scholarships on the East Coast, but there was none on the West Coast. So they were all club um, at that time. So Santa Clara, University of Washington, um, all of that was club. Um, so I had to go East Coast um, if I wanted to play uh, D1 soccer um, and, and get a college scholarship. And so I looked at, you know, UNC and UMass and uh, University of Central Florida and yeah, I decided to go to UCF. I kind of like the underdog-ish, kind of rugged, badass, you know, fighter uh, kind of mentality of that that team. Um, so that, that's in part why I went there. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that's why Abby... Yeah, and, you're a gator. Abby and Fotop, right? that's why they ended up yeah. coming to UF. And then we ended up having the opportunity to play in the national championship game. So um after college i'm sure you were a lot like me you know there was no national team there was no league so how did you decide what to do next once you once you were done playing college soccer yeah um so yeah there well there was a national team starting in 85 so i was actually a sophomore in college when that first started and so it it uh, our schedule kind of increased ansa became the coach and our schedule increased um but i graduated uh, I redshirted a year, graduated in 89. So I, you know, you know how, I don't know if this happened to you, but I, you know, it was like, oh, so you're going to go coach, right? And so I, I was like, oh, I kind of hate coaching, but I'll try it. So I tried it, you know, assistant coach at UCF there. And um, I just did not like coaching. I, I like training like individuals or kids, um, but not the overall coaching um thing so in the meantime i was like i want to continue playing i actually went and uh this guy did me you want to try and kick uh field goals uh for the nfl and i was like sure so um i tried a little bit of that and and then ultimately i was like no i want to play for i want to my goal is to be the best player in the world um oh there's my my that's my cat tail my cat right there um and um, so I went overseas and played in Sweden um, professionally. And um, oh my God, so, I'm so sorry. This is my one of my kitties. Okay, that's Go okay. Away. We love um, we love animals, Michelle. <laughs> she always does that. Um, and so I went and played in Sweden in '90, and then uh, you know it was announced. Okay, they're having a qualifying tournament for U.S. national team um and a world cup and in haiti and then we won that and then there was a world cup like within months later uh of that so it it kind of like you know i i kept following my heart i i tried the logic coaching and i i just couldn't do it and then i just followed my heart on because i wanted to keep playing and thankfully you know every step um that i was ready you know to kind of walk through that door opened simultaneously um, with the U.S. team, and um, I just kept following the game and the opportunities within. Did did going overseas um, and playing or is it Teresa? Um, yeah, ter well, I can't even say it right. They they laughed at me. It, it's I say tier so but they're like Teresa. Okay. We'll go okay. with your, we'll go with your version because yeah. I'm turning off. Tier so uh, yeah. What. Did you feel like their style of play impacted yours and, and made you an even better player from that experience? Oh, yeah. So in 90, um, Anson, 
I was a center midi and Anton pushed me into, you know, a target player or center forward up front, which I, I hated uh, that. That wasn't my goal scoring mentality was not mine at all. Um, I was just midfielder. I, I, I loved um, kind of developing the game and distributing and all that. I like scoring, but not like that, not like a true goal scorer. Um, so I had to learn um, how do I, how this, this is an entirely different mentality and mindset and it's, it's all back to goal and just so different. So I went to Sweden to learn that, but they didn't want me to play up front. Um, so my, the second objective I went there was to learn how to be um, a game changer, like, a, uh, you know, an Abby Wambach basically, um, you know, how, how I want to make the difference of the game. I want to be able to change the outcome. And so my team was division two and they were wanting to be division one. So they wanted me to elevate, you know, the, the, their opportunity. Um, so that, that's what it did. It, it, it made me win games. It made me um, take, take on people and do things that um, I, I was uncomfortable doing. And if I didn't do it, then we would lose. So I, I did it. And I, the, the Swedish women's national team coach was our coach and their youth coach was our assistant coach. So it was really, um, I, got, I had the greatest experience. And it, it really helped me because right off that, we went into the 91 World Cup and then I had a great World Cup. I scored 10 goals and I was that player that I was aspiring to be. And, and all the while you didn't want to be a big goal scorer, but hey, you just scored 10 goals. I, I in the know. Anyone World Cup. No, no I, biggie. No biggie. <laughs> um, hey, so Michelle, when you look back on your wildly successful career, what, what was your favorite moment? My favorite moment? Um, that's so hard. Uh, I, I think, um, I, I don't know really if there's a favorite moment, but, um, it, it was, it's most, it was mostly like the times when we like you know, and they, the coach is like, okay, we're going to do fitness and, and everyone is standing on that line and you're looking down and you're, you know, running and you're, it, it's painful. Right. Um, and you're struggling and everyone is, but then, and then I would look down and look at everybody. And it was just, I don't know, there's something about doing something together um, that was almost impossible and so hard, but yet we were totally committed and all in. So it was mostly that, like, I don't know, that like one slice of mentality I guess that together thing and, and doing this something incredible um again and again and again that that piece has stayed with me and I think is the biggest thing that I miss um, um and I don't even really miss uh the game uh playing I, I just I miss being a part of that bigger thing that with incredible people that was just it was so inspiring. It's still, you know, it still fills me up uh, every day. That's what I miss the most too. And I think it's camaraderie, you know, and, and yeah. I just love the fact that you would pick fitness and that just goes yeah. to you while you were as mentally tough as, <laughs> as you were. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the chronic fatigue, um, you know, that's something that you had to deal with throughout your playing career. At, at yeah. what point did you, did you realize that that was what you were battling and what were some of the things that you had to change in order to really get your best performance still? Yeah, that, well, after the 9 one World Cup, I started feeling, I, I was just exhausted and I, you know, couldn't, I'd go out to train and I just couldn't get through it. I, I couldn't get, do the smallest things you know that before it was like woohoo and fun and i couldn't do it so i kept getting worse um and i kept thinking oh, i just need to take a break i'll just rest i'll just buck up and play through it or and i just it was impossible to do that so um finally uh so it took two years to get a diagnosis the chronic fatigue kind of diagnosis or chronic epstein bar uh, virus um so it was really tough figuring out what to do because I kept saying, well, just give me the, you know, give me a shot or give me some pills and I'll be 
fine, but there was nothing like that for um, what I was going through. So it was, you know, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, um, exploring alternative medicine options and matching that with traditional meds that worked and strategies. My doctors talked to doctors I talked to. And so we, I changed. I ended up changing my my diet, um, so I was, ate a really strict diet, um, and you know, no caffeine, no sugar, really. Um, I guess, and, and part of it was the elimination diet, which is a a, a way to figure out what foods are actually um, contributing to how how bad you're feeling. Um, in which I found out I was I had a, a dairy allergy. So when I once I got better diet from that with my dairy. I was like a million times better. Uh, but IVs, because they also found out I had a, um, this low blood pressure uh, condition called neurally mediated hypotension. Um, and then I couldn't take the meds because those meds were a banned substance. So I was like, she, she, she yikes, right? Um, <laughs> I, uh, so, uh, you know, I took the, I, we did the IVs and I drank coffee at halftime to vasoconstrict and hydrate um so and then i had to change the kind of player i was i i had to play differently i had to um, you know stretch out the energy i had but still how do i be effective for my team and um you know can i be effective as this kind of player so it was, it was a um you know a, a soul test uh to say the least um but it also um, it made me a better player um, at the same time. Um, and I was still going through a lot of injuries too. So, you know, playing left footed and sick half the time wasn't that fun, but I, what I was, you know, focusing on the entire time was how is this making me better? How, what am I learning as a person? How, you know, um, how, how, you know, how can I contribute to my team differently? Um, and, and that's the part I loved was, um, and that's what kept me going was knowing that if I'm, if I'm contributing to my team, I'm helping them be their best. And so that, that at the end of the day was my big motivator. Um, you know, hearing Carla Overbeck yell at me, Yankers get back. I was like, you know, I could have run through a brick wall, um, you know, with no legs and no arms just because I heard her yell that I need to get back and help the team. So it was, you know, incredibly motivating for me to um, be there and do what I could for us to be successful. That's very inspiring, Michelle. You have no idea. And you're such a warrior. Um, you know, one of the things that I always heard from so many people was just how mentally tough you were. So I'm just curious, where, where did your mental toughness come from? <laughs> It could be called stubbornness. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think my parents would definitely say that. Um, Tony DeChico would say that. Uh, but I, uh, it definitely, it, there is a stubbornness to me. <laughs> but there's also just um, t this one writer, he wrote um, this story about the warrior and the sea, and it talks, and this, this chief told his two sons to go you know in search of these um you know bring go into the wild and bring something back um that will impress me and so one son went out and he i don't know what he brought back rocks or something let's just say in uh fish who knows okay so then but the other guy went running and he ran through the over you know up the highest mountains down the lowest valleys across these raging rivers and um he went through all this and all this struggle and hard uh, a hard journey and and to see the sea uh and that was what he brought back was like i but i saw the sea and so that's kind of um why i played right i just love that um whole experience the whole experience of it and the the journey um Get, the journey is what it makes it um, all worthwhile. Um, so it's really nothing about anything that you win. Although winning, I killed people to win, right? I ran them over and and was pissed when they didn't when they got in my way. But it, but 
that was part of the journey. So I liked it when it was uh, difficult. So the more difficult it was, the more rewarding it was to see the sea at the end of the day. So that is the mentality. That's the, it, that's the thing that doesn't let me let go or give up. Um, all right. So I, I wanted to ask, when did you, do you kind of feel like the popularity and the support by the Federation was changing for the U S women's national team? Yeah, I think things started to change. Um, uh, once the Olympics was announced, like, you know, in 96, it was the first time women's soccer was included in the Olympics. So that's an American sport. Um, and the team, um, was obviously you know one of the one of the running teams to win um so that as we kept going that increased our uh, popularity and um exposure and people got to know our stories and then everyone climbed on board i think uh during that tournament and then on the way to winning that gold medal so and my dogs are barking um and so I think that was the beginning. I think that was what kind of launched us into then taking on this World Cup in 99 and what the potential could be, you know, based on on um, our team winning that gold medal and, and if, if the event was promoted in the right way. So first Olympics yeah. and it's in the States. Yeah. What was that like for you guys? How important was that moment? Yeah. That, that was it. That was so fun. I mean, okay. So that was the only Olympics I got to play in. Um, Cause then I, re after the 99 world cup, I was too beat up. I was done. Um, so that Olympics though uh, was so exciting because the Olympics are exciting, right? You're gosh um, to compete against all those countries. Um, that part I got right away, right? I was a little slow on the uptake at the beginning of the U.S. Women's National Team understanding that, but the Olympics, I already understood that, and and then it was here in the U.S., and so having the whole U U.S., the whole United States behind us um, while we're competing at uh, against these other countries for the Olympics was like the ultimate of, you know, epitome uh, opportunities, and then the crowds were amazing, and the games were great. So it was the gold medal, you know, gosh, that was, that, though, that was a moment, you know, watching as a kid, uh, all these Olympians standing on that podium and, and watching their struggle and, and then they're winning and getting that gold medal. And then we were doing it. You hear that music, you know, and you walk out as you have done many times. Um, and there's just chills, right? So it was really, that was a cool experience. It had to have been. Um, if you could go back and change one thing, either a choice that you made or a habit during your playing career, what would it have been? That is hard. Dang you. Sorry. That is a hard question. Sorry, Acres. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I, you know, I, I, I struggle with... Um, it was like two things. One, one is, okay, so obviously I've had a lot of surgeries and injuries from playing for the U S. Um, so, you know, I over 30 surgeries now on this one knee, it looks like, God, I got, I got in a fight with Freddy Krueger. Um, so, and then broke my face. So a lot of surgeries there, shoulder, I mean, concussion. So it's, um, yeah, I don't, so at times I'm like, gosh, you know, we, uh, my, in my uh, career, I didn't get, I didn't capitalize. I didn't get those big money opportunities. Um, so it's not like I am, you know, an ex NFLer or a now, you know, a player nowadays who has tons more opportunity to, to cash in. Right. Um, so sometimes I think, God, I wish I, sometimes I think I, it would have been nice to have more of my body um put you know not in pieces <laughs> um so i can you know live out the rest of my dream uh for with these horses and be a, and be able to be active and 
enjoy life with my son and et cetera. So sometimes I think, oh, do I regret that? Maybe, maybe a little bit. Um, I have to yell at my dogs. Puppies! No! Bad dogs. Um, that, so that, and then, I, and then I bounce back and I go, no, I couldn't have done it any other way. I, that is totally me. I loved playing. I, I can't, so I can't regret that, but that is one thing I would love. Um, I, I wish, I wish I hadn't had, to, uh, had so much physical wreckage, um, to co complete my career in the way I wanted to. And then, um, so that's, that's one, that's one thing. Well, I think you, you touched on two things for me right there. You know, the first is that you weren't getting paid as much for doing something that you loved, right. And you're playing for the love of the game. Um, even when Abby retired, she, you know, stood up on a stage next to, I think it was Peyton Manning and maybe, maybe yeah. Tiger Woods. And she's like, here I am one of the best, just like yourself, but yet I don't yeah. have the uh, bank account to show for it. I um, love that she did that. I yeah. And, and I think the other thing that you pointed out is 30 surgeries, Michelle. I mean, I you, you put your body on the line and how can you as soccer do a better job of taking care of its former athletes because we know that once you're done you're done and there's no health insurance there's no payments and so obviously how can they do a better job for all athletes moving forward yeah so you know everybody who played for that team i mean i i 15 years i and i had to pay for my i mean i actually had to sue u.s soccer when i retired to pay for surgeries from that 99 world cup from injuries from that 99 world cup um it, just to have the surgeries I needed. So it's, you know, that, that shouldn't have happened. Um, I, you know, it seems like the, the right thing to do would be to have your know, soccer um, giving back and taking care of the athletes that contributed to their, to the, the program, um, the, a successful program. Um, but, you know, that has historically not been the case, obviously. It'd be great if it, that changed. Um, I mean, we, I don't even get free tickets to the game. So how can I expect them to take care of my body? Um, you know, after, uh, you know, playing for that team. So, um, I, I also, so you're, I don't know, your, your guess is as good as mine for that. Although I'd welcome, um, some support health wise, um, for, for all of us who need it. And, you know, the other part is, um, I, 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 you know, it, it would be great if we had like, kind of like, you know, uh, how the NFL, um, has begun to take care of their own veterans, you know, the current players pay into a, a fund and then there's opportunities, um, for the retired players as well. But, um, because, you know, everyone is going to be a retired player at one point. So it seems to make sense that we could somehow figure out a way um, as a team, a, a total U.S. national team, to um, help w the you know, situation everyone is gonna be in at one point as a retired uh, veteran U.S. women's national team player. So I don't know, there's gotta be a way. Um, I, and I'm, I'm not sure U.S. soccer is actually is, is an answer. I, although Cindy, Cindy Parlow, who's that, that is not her name, I know, but um, the, our president, you know, she played for the U.S. team. She's had lots of injuries, too. So, I don't know, maybe they're working on something that will, um, you know, change the whole conversation right now and, and uh, begin um, to make a difference um, in the lives of, you know, families, really, um, and families of these players who gave a lot to, to the game and to the team. We'll see. I don't know. What about you? What do you think? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that you unfortunately had to go back to soccer. You had to sue them. I did a, something similar with ACL and my concussions that I had also. Um, so I think every player should do that, but I don't think yeah. that they should have to. You know, yeah. and I, I yeah. like the idea about the fact that the players, maybe um, the alumni put something together to help out um because eventually they will be there also so you're right yeah. and I think it's a friendly reminder for everybody um obviously you inspired me greatly michelle i would love to know who inspired you and when you were growing up and when you were playing yeah ah uh, gosh you know 
obviously my my parents um you know how i just and seeing you know my dad he 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 um he was a meat cutter uh for safeway and he put himself through school um and became a counselor um and he had dyslexia like his writing you know my horses can write better than he can um so he how he got through um all that school and to do a profession that you know a counselor professional um for so many years and helped a lot of people that was inspiring to me um and then my mom was um she was one of the first female firefighters in king county um seattle um so you know she kind of op opened a lot of doors but i also you know when watching her i never um i never um thought I, I never saw an obstacle in front of myself just because I was like, oh, I, anything I wanted to do, I just went for, um, cause it wasn't, why not? Right. Um, so there was really no, no obstacle for me. Um, and if there wasn't an opportunity, I found it, what I wanted to do someplace else with someone else. So I, it's, it's, so those two people, um, and then there's, you know several people along the way um and i'm like one of those people who i i i'm an observer and i i get um the small i i i like see the smallest thing and and it is becomes something big um for me uh personally internally um and so you know i what just watching like I, I mentioned Abby Wambach and um, watching her play. Um, and then a lot of the players now play and um, God, all, I mean, all those little things that they do, some of the comments they make that are really profound and they're profound based on um, the context in which I see the game. So, you know, from way back when, and they're saying this it, and it's, profound for this day but it's wow it's mind-blowing to look back over and see how incredible really their statement is and the things that they are doing um and you know okay so my son is a huge inspiration to me um he's a huge you know he's the guy is 15 and 6 1 and he um he got bullied in middle school so bad i had to pull him out of school and do online school for a year and a half. And then he went to high school, um, which he loved and was thriving and was on in, in JROTC and doing orienteering. And, um, and he is not a runner cause he's a massive big body guy. And yet he excelled in this running stuff, um, and loved it. And Georgia, um, <laughs> and, and loved it. And, and then, um, you know, COVID hit. And so, but he continues to, everything that happens um, with him, he continues to inspire me. My, and my animals inspire me, except for Jojo right now, who is freaking barking um, at, at, at whoever's in my backyard or whatever's going on, whatever squirrel is running through my backyard. So, um, but my animals, my horses, you know, every, every all of them that I, I get to spend time with, there's always something I see that is just really, God, it's just mind blowing and great, full of grace and um, really inspirational. Um, so, so, and I get to be around that every day. So it makes, you know, all I have to do is open my eyes and I'm like inspired. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And we started talking about this before, but obviously you're, you're living my dream life. Um, Let even, me yell even, at these even guys. Jojo barking. It's okay. Ready? You guys know. That's so embarrassing. We'll, oh we'll see how long, you know, it just, it gives us all flashbacks as to what it might've been like on, on the field with you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh so, my God. As I was saying, I, I love animals. I would love for some, someday to have my own sanctuary. Yeah. So it's hard to tell us, but I want you to finish. How did you, how did you get into this? And yeah. obviously how can we all help you out? Yeah. I, well, I, I got into it just by volunteering to, you know, uh, ch transport uh, uh, horses who 
were brought into the animal control facility and what, would I transport them? Would I foster them? And so I, I said yes. And then, you know, of course, the next morning, literally they, hey, we have this half dead abused horse that's probably not going to make it. Would you foster it? And so I, like I, you know, said, Christine Lilly inspired me with her thing about, you know, it's just, just try. It's so easy just to try. And so I, you know, rose above my fears of being heartbroken by having this starved, uh, abused horse in my barn and seeing her every day. And like, gosh, um, and I just tried. So I took her home. I, I went and got her and walked her in my barn. And she, she was like, oh, like, oh. and I saw that and I was like, oh my God, I can totally do this. Like it was, I was like, I realized I would, you know, gosh, jump off a cliff to help um, help the, these animals who need it so, so badly, um, sometimes. So I just started, um, asking a lot of questions and I, you know, over the course of months and years, I learned how, how to, you know, to refeed, I'd take care of, to let go of a lot of animals who were, you know, struggling. It was, you know, they, they, they needed to pass. So it, it it um so that's how kind of how I got into it and it and along the way too they you know there there's something amazing about bringing the light back into um someone who has you know totally left themselves and in, in, in due to suffering um and so when I get to be a part of that um it is uh you know when one of my <laughs> One of those, that horse, that first horse I saved is Zoe, is her name. And um, she was kind of this passive, she was a beautiful black um, horse, old, older. And, and when she, but two years later, after I, we, she, she, you know, kind of came back to life. She was a sassy, like sassy, right? And I, I was like, yes, I thought this is awesome because she's being who she's meant to be and she's she feels good enough to be sassy and want to bite me sometimes I, so i was like yes um not that i let her bite me but um so that part seeing them um that happy and uh, thriving is really um why i continue to stay in it. and then the mentality through my soccer uh, career and life has kind of kept that um as um, you know, um, part part of uh, what I love to do every day, and and being able to do that every day, um, even though it's really it's hard sometimes. Um, so, and you know, right now with all the COVID, you know, I I have no income uh, because of COVID, and my and the donations people are struggling, so it's, it's hard for people to give. So right now, you know, money matters. Uh, so it's, I'm 501c3. And, um, once I get mine, our needs met so I can take care of my guys and, and hear it at, at my place, I am always reaching out to other sanctuaries, um, and other rescues and, you know, offering what, what I can give to, cause we're all, you know, under the same circumstances and working toward the same goal of, you know, saving, saving these animals and putting them with people who love them and will take care of them. Um, so that's, uh, anyway, that's, that's the majority of my day. I'm a mom and I clean up a lot of horse poop and, you know, uh, take care of all those horses down in my pasture and a bunch of dogs and cats. And, and, um, you know, if you saw like here down, it would be complete dirt and mud and, um, there's probably hay in my hair. So that, <laughs> it is totally, uh, it's sort of my dream come true. <laughs> well, I just, I, I, I love what you say about it was hard at first and you didn't want to do it, but you were able to overcome that fear and that, you know, bringing light back into their life, life is why you do it. And yeah. so I think there's something so special about the people that want to be the voice of the voiceless and you have a huge heart, obviously, Michelle. And I just, my last question for you is how and where can we help you? I know times are tough for a lot of people, but for those that do want to help, how can we help you? Yeah, thanks. I, well, my website, uh, michelleacres.org, which we're 
kind of revamping. Um, but that, there you can see pictures and, and some, some stories and um, some buttons to click on to donate. Um, I have an Amazon wish list. Um, I'm on, I, and I say this wrong all the time, Patreon. Patreon, I said it right. My son yeah. will be happy. Um, Michelle Akers Horse Rescue, um, so you can you know donate there monthly, and um, and also the social media stuff. I'm I'm always putting on donating pictures of everybody and um, having fun with that with the animals and making fun of myself. So um, you know follow me on Instagram and Twitter and all that. Um, and I'm always keeping you you know people in the loop on what's happening here. So um, that, that's a couple ways. I appreciate you asking. No problem. Thanks for having a huge heart for obviously paving the way from women's soccer for showing us what heart and determination looks like for being a hero of mine and for taking the time to share with us today. Um, you're so inspirational and we thank you so, so much for coming on with us today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Anytime and ha happy agree. Halloween. I, I'll, we might have to trick or treat you guys. So uh, thanks for having us. Appreciate Anytime. it.